gentlemen. I haven't seen this many collars in front of me, um, except the last time I was at the Vatican. This is really amazing. I have to tell you that I, I'm nearly breathless <clears throat> and beyond humbled to be with all of you today. Because I can't tell you how many times that I sat where you are and I thought in the middle of a homily, do you think he'd mind if I raise my hand? <laughs> Maybe there's an observation to make. Maybe there's something new to add. And so I thought this was a really great opportunity because as a woman of faith, a seeker, a writer, it seems to me the dialogue is really natural. So today we will dialogue. Bishop David O'Connell, I cry when I say your name. I thank you for this opportunity. Today is precisely two months since my last broadcast at Channel 3. And about four or five days after October the 15th, Bishop O'Connell called me with his proposal. It's so rare to be asked to share a faith journey, especially with men who are in the business of helping people share a faith journey. And to be asked by your bishop, it is very humbling. Bishop David is my friend and my personal hero. He inspires me. This is not breaking news to him because I've told him about this before, but let me tell you why. David O'Connell heard his calling to the priesthood and he answered it enthusiastically. Then he proceeded to live it through the prism of parish work and higher education and leadership and extraordinary physical challenges. And if that is not enough, Without a moment's reservation, he agrees to speak amid the glare of television lights, all in the spirit of understanding. In all of these settings, Bishop David has offered a better understanding of our Catholic faith. And especially with our CBS Philadelphia extended live broadcast of Pope Francis's visit, Bishop O'Connell became God's anchor man that day, or over those two days. Our team loved him, and they sat in awe of the context and the candor that he brought to our coverage and to the faith that we all share. And for that and for so much more, before your priest today, I thank you for sharing your extraordinary gift. So, we are here today to dialogue, but not directly about your vocation, but more about mine. Wife, mother, professional, Catholic woman. I believe that we are all called to have a better understanding of living our vocation. I was raised in a loving Catholic household. Mary and Charles Shiraki built a home where they placed God first. A well-worn story in our family history involved a Sunday when my parents were a very young married couple, before they even had any of us, me and my two brothers, and they were headed out to church and they went looking for a donation to make at Mass. They were looking for a few dollars, and my father in the mushroom business hadn't been paid for his crop yet, and so they looked in every purse and every pocket and they came up with four quarters. Dad told us how he and mom had looked and looked and they came up with these four quarters and I had said to him, Daddy, but didn't you need it? And he said, Patty, I always believed that if I put God first and put my trust there, everything else would work out. And it did. Weeks after my father's death in 1999, a police chief in the little town where I lived in Kennett Square wrote me a letter detailing a very quiet gift my father had given. A family with a very sick mom, three children, and a dad whose fortunes had turned sour were struggling. It was a very bitterly cold winter and their heater was broken. And this police chief friend, his name is Albert McCarthy, one of 12 children. He had grown up with me and he came to my dad, who had by that time built a very successful business, and he asked if my dad would help this family. 
So dad agreed very quickly. He said, sure, I'll give you the money. You know, go ahead, get it taken care of. And Albert said, but I'm a, you know, I'm a police officer. I can't take your money. But whatever you can do, Mr. Shiraki, would be really great. In his letter, Albert writes, <clears throat> a new heater arrived at this family's home. The wife's health improved. So did the father's business. And when he came back to ask who had given him the money for the heater because he wanted to pay him back, Albert called my dad. And dad said that he wanted to remain anonymous and he didn't want to be repaid. Instead, he suggested this. He said, tell the gentleman to take his money and to make a contribution at St. Patrick's Church, which was our family church. And he said, and ask him to do it in Thanksgiving for being able to be helped at a time when he needed help. And then tell him again and remind him that if somebody else needs help, that now he needs to help someone else. Gentlemen, I don't know where my father's faith really came from. I don't know what really ignited it, but I found that it burns perpetually, even though he's in heaven right now for 16 years. But that burning faith has been a guiding beacon in every storm. Perhaps it was that faith that connected my parents to wonderful priests, priest friends who came to our home when I was a child, and they were really good priests and fun priests. They would eat potato chips with us. They would sit on the sofa and they would watch a movie with the family. But I found that in the process, they were teaching us as well. With the encouragement of a young priest who is now, believe it or not, 91 years of age, who Bishop O'Connell got a chance to meet when we were at the Shrine of the Miraculous Medal. And he doesn't even know that priests are really supposed to retire at the age of 75. <clears throat> because of his encouragement, our home was enthroned to the Sacred Heart. And as, a, as an adolescent, we prayed the rosary on Sundays in our living room. Prayer would always lead us. And when there was a crisis in the family, a child born out of wedlock who needed to be baptized, a non-Catholic fiance who wanted to convert to Catholicism, an alcoholic spouse who needed guidance, I would watch my parents turn to their priests, to a priest friend, over and over again. Those who needed compassion were not scolded. They were guided. They were shown mercy. They were offered a pathway to forgiveness and to counsel and to, and to be counseled to trust in God's providence. It is that Catholic faith that has shaped me.